Hello, this is your friendly neighborhood school nurse, Miss Carrie, and I'm reading part two of My Side of the Mountain by Jean Craighead George, in which I find many useful plants. The following morning, I stood up, stretched, and looked about me. Birds were dripping from the trees, little birds, singing and flying and pouring over the limbs. This must be the warbler migration, I said, and I laughed because there were so many birds. I had never seen so many. My big voice rolled through the woods, and their little voices seemed to rise and answer me. They were eating. Three or four in a maple tree near me were darting along the limbs, pecking and snatching at something delicious on the trees. I wondered if there was anything there for a hungry boy. I pulled a limb down, and all I saw were leaves, twigs, and flowers. I ate a flower. It was not very good. One manual I had read said to watch what the birds and animals were eating in order to learn what is edible and non-edible in the forest. If the animal life can eat it, it is safe for humans. The book did suggest that a raccoon had tastes more nearly like ours. Certainly the birds were no example. Then I wondered if they were not eating something I couldn't see. Tiny insects, perhaps. Well, anyway, whatever it was, I decided to fish. I took my line and hook and walked down to the stream. I lay on a log and dangled my line in the bright water. The fish were not biting. That made me hungrier. My stomach pinched. You know, it really does hurt to be terribly hungry. A stream is supposed to be full of food. It is the easiest place to get a lot of food in a hurry. I needed something in a hurry, but what? I looked through the clear water and saw the tracks of mussels in the mud. I ran along the log back to shore, took off my clothes, and plunged into that icy water. I collected almost a peck of mussels in very little time at all and began tying them in my sweater to carry them back to camp. But I don't have to carry them anywhere, I said to myself. I have my fire in my pocket. I don't need a table. I can sit right here by the stream and eat. And so I did. I wrapped the mussels in leaves and sort of steamed them in coals. They are not quite as good as clams. A little stronger, I would say. But by the time I had eaten three, I had forgotten what clams tasted like and knew only how delicious freshwater mussels were. I actually got full. I wandered back to my great-grandfather's farm and began to explore. Most of the acreage was maple and beech, some pine, dogwoods, ash, and here and there a glorious hickory. I made a sketch of the farm on my road map, put X's where the hickories were. They were gold trees to me. I would have hickory nuts in the fall. I could also make salt from hickory limbs. I cut off one and chopped it into bits and scraps. I stuck them in my sweater. The land was up and down and up and down, and I wondered how great-grandfather ever cut it and plowed it. There was one stream running through it, which I was glad to see, for it meant I did not have to go all the way down the mountain to the big creek for fish and water. Around noon, I came upon what I was sure was the old foundation of the house. Miss Turner was right. It was ruins. A few stones in a square, a slight depression for the basement, and trees growing right up through what had once been the living room. I wandered around to see what was left of the gribbly home. After a few looks, I saw an apple tree. I rushed up to it, hoping to find an old apple. No apples beneath it. About forty feet away, however, I found a dried one in the crotch of a tree, stuck there by a squirrel and forgotten. I ate it. It was pretty bad, but nourishing, I hoped. There was another apple tree and three walnuts. I scribbled X's. These were wonderful finds. I poked around the foundations, hoping to uncover some old iron implements that I could use. I found nothing. Too many leaves had fallen and turned to loam. Too many plants had grown up and died down over the old home site. I decided to come back when I had made myself a shovel. Whistling and looking for food and shelter, I went on up the mountain, following the stone walls discovering many things about my property. I found a marsh. In it were cattails and arrow leaf, good starchy foods. At high noon, I stepped onto a mountain meadow. 
An enormous boulder rose up in the center of it. At the top of the meadow was a fringe of white birch. There were maples and oaks to the west and a hemlock forward forest to the right that pulled me right across the sweet grasses into it. Never, never had I seen such trees. They were giants, old, old giants. They must have begun when the world began. I started walking around them. I couldn't hear myself step, so dense and damp were the needles. Great boulders covered with ferns and moss stood among them. They looked like pebbles beneath those trees. Standing before the biggest and the oldest and the most king-like of them all, I suddenly had an idea. This is about the old, old tree. I knew enough about the Catskill Mountains to know that when the summer came, they were covered with people. Although great-grandfather's farm was somewhat remote, still hikers and campers and hunters and fishermen were sure to wander across it. Therefore, I wanted a house that could not be seen. People would want to take me back where I belonged if they found me. I looked at that tree. Somehow I knew it was home, but I was not quite sure how it was home. The limbs were high and not right for a tree house. I could build a bark extension around it, but that would look silly. Slowly I circled the great trunk. Halfway around the whole halfway around, the whole plan became perfectly obvious. To the west, between two of the flanges of the tree that spread out to be roots, was a cavity. The heart of the tree was rotting away. I scraped at it with my hands. Old, rotten, insect-ridden dust came tumbling out. I dug on and on, using my axe from time to time as my excitement grew. With much of the old rot out, I could crawl in the tree and sit cross-legged. Inside, I felt as cozy as a turtle in its shell. I chopped and chopped until I was hungry and exhausted. I was now in the hard, good wood, and chopping it out was work. I was afraid December would come before I got a hole big enough to lie in, so I sat down to think. You know, those first days, I just never planned right. I had the beginnings of a home, but not a bite to eat, and I had worked so hard that I could hardly move forward to find that bite. Furthermore, it was discouraging to feed that body of mine. It was never satisfied, and gathering food for it took time and got it hungrier. Trying to get a place to rest, it took time and got it more tired, and I really felt like I was going in circles and wondered how primitive man had ever had enough time and energy to stop hunting food and start thinking about fire and tools. I left the tree and went across the meadow looking for food. I plunged into the woods beyond, and there I discovered the gorge and the white cascade splashing down the black rocks into the pool below. I was hot and dirty. I scrambled down the rocks and slipped into the pool. It was so cold I yelled. But when I came out on the bank and put on my two pairs of trousers and three sweaters, which I thought was a better way to carry clothes than in a pack, I tingled and burned and felt coltish. I leapt up the bank, slipped, and my face went down in a patch of dog-tooth violets. You would know them anywhere after a few looks at them in the botanical gardens and in colored flower books. They are little yellow lilies on long, slender stems with oval leaves dappled with gray. But that's not all. They have wonderfully tasty bulbs. I was filling my pockets before I got up from my fall. I'll have a salad-type lunch, I said, as I moved up the steep sides of the ravine. I discovered that as late as it was in the season, the spring beauties were still blooming in the cool pockets of the woods. They are all right raw, that is if you're as hungry as I was. They taste a little like lima beans. I ate these as I went on hunting food, feeling better and better, until I worked my way back to the meadow where the dandelions were blooming. Funny I hadn't noticed them either, earlier. Their greens are good, and so are their roots. A little strong and milky, but you get used to that. A crow flew into the aspen grove without saying a word. The little I knew of the crows from following them in Central Park, they always have something to say. But this bird was sneaking, obviously trying to be quiet. Birds are good food. Crow is certainly not the best. But I did not know that then, and I launched out to see where it was going. I had a vague plan to try to noose it. This is the kind of thing I wasted time on in those days when time was so important. 
However, this venture turned out all right, because I did not have to noose that bird. I stepped into the woods, looked around, could not see the crow, but noticed a big stick nest in a scrabbly pine. I started to climb the tree. Off flew the crow. What made me keep on climbing in face of such discouragement, I don't know, but I did, and that noon I had crow eggs and wild salad for lunch. At lunch I also solved the problem of carving out my tree. After a struggle, I made a fire. Then I sewed a big skunk cabbage leaf into a cup with grass strands. I had read that you can boil water in a leaf, and ever since then I had been very anxious to see if this were true. It seems impossible, but it works. I boiled the eggs in a leaf. The water keeps the leaf wet, and although the top dries up and burns down to the water level, that's as far as the burning goes. I was pleased to see it work. Then, here's what happened. Naturally, all this took a lot of time, and I hadn't gotten very far on my tree, so I was fretting and stamping out the fire when I stopped with my foot in the air. The fire! Indians made dugout canoes with fire. They burned them out, an easier and much faster way of getting results. I would try fire in the tree. If I was very careful, perhaps it would work. I ran into the hemlock forest with a burning stick and got a fire going inside the tree. Thinking that I ought to have a bucket of water in case things got out of hand, I looked desperately around me. The water was far across the meadow and down the ravine. This would never do. I began to think the whole inspiration of a home in the tree was no good. I really did have to live near water for cooking and drinking and comfort. I looked sadly at the magnificent hemlock and was about to put the fire out and desert it when I said something to myself. It must have come out of some book. Hemlocks usually grow around mountain streams and springs. I swirled on my heel. Nothing but boulders around me, but the air was damp somewhere, I said, and darted around the rocks, peering and looking and sniffing and going down into pockets and dales. No water. I was coming back, circling wide, when I almost fell in it. Two sentinel boulders, dripping wet, decorated with flowers, ferns, moss, weeds, everything that loved water, guarded a bathtub-sized spring. You pretty thing, I said, flopped on my stomach and pushed my face into it to drink. I opened my eyes. The water was like glass, and in it were little insects with oars. They rode away from me. Beetles skittered like bullets on the surface, or carried a silver bubble of air with them to the bottom. Ha! Then I saw a crayfish. I jumped up, overturned rocks, and found many crayfish. At first I hesitated to grab them, because they can pinch. I gritted my teeth, thought about how much more it hurts to be hungry, and came down upon them. I did get pinched, but I had my dinner. And that was the first time I had planned ahead. Any planning that I did in those early days was such a surprise to me and so successful that I was delighted even with a small plan. I wrapped the crayfish in leaves, stuffing them in my pockets, and went back to the burning tree. Bucket of water, I thought. Bucket of water. Where was I going to get a bucket? How did I think, even if I found water, I could get it back to the tree? That's how cityfied I was in those days. I had never lived without a bucket before. Scrub brushes, water buckets... And so when a water problem came up, I just thought I could run to the kitchen and get a bucket. Well, dirt is as good as water, I said, as I ran back to my tree. I can smother the fire with dirt. Days passed working, burning, cutting, gathering food, and each day I cut another notch on an aspen pole that I had stuck in the ground for a calendar. In which I meet one of my own kind and have a terrible time getting away. Five notches into June, my house was done. I could stand in it, lie down in it, and there was room left over for a stump to sit on. On warm evenings, I would lie on my stomach and look out the door, listen to the frogs and night hawks, and hope it would storm so that I could crawl into my tree and be dry. I had gotten soaked during a couple of May downpours, and now that my house was done, I wanted the chance to sit in my hemlock and watch a cloudburst wet everything but me. This opportunity didn't come for a long time. It was dry. One morning I was at the edge of the meadow. I had cut down a small ash tree and was chopping it into lengths of about 18 inches each. 
this was the beginning of my bed that I was planning to work on after supper every night. With the golden summer upon me, food was much easier to get, and I actually had several hours of free time after supper in which to do other things. I had been eating frog's legs, turtles, and best of all, an occasional rabbit. My snares and traps were set now. Furthermore, I had a good supply of cattail roots I had dug in the marsh. If you ever eat cattails, be sure to cook them well. Otherwise, the fibers are tough and they take more chewing to get the starchy food from them than they are worth. However, they taste just like potatoes after you've been eating them a couple of weeks, and to my way of thinking, are extremely good. Well, anyway, that summer morning when I was gathering material for a bed, I was singing and chopping and playing a game with a raccoon I had come to know. He had just crawled in a hollow tree and had gone to bed for the day when I came to the meadow. From time to time, I would tap on his tree with my axe. He would hang his sleepy head out, snarl at me, close his eyes, and slide out of sight. The third time I did this, I knew something was happening in the forest. Instead of closing his eyes, he pricked up his ears and his face became drawn and tense. His eyes were focused on something down the mountain. I stood up and looked. I could see nothing. I squatted down and went back to work. The raccoon dove out of sight. Now, what's got you all excited, I said, and tried once more to see what he had seen. I finished the post for the bed and was looking around for a bigger ash to fell and make slats for the springs when I nearly jumped out of my shoes. Now, what are you doing up here all alone? It was a human voice. I swung around and stood face to face with a little old lady in a pale blue sunbonnet and a loose brown dress. Oh, gosh, I said. Don't scare me like that. Say one word at a time until I get used to a human voice. I must have looked frightened because she chuckled, smoothed down the front of her dress and whispered, Are you lost? Oh, no, ma'am, I stuttered. Then a little fellow like you should not be all alone way up here on this haunted mountain. Haunted, said I. Yes, indeed. There's an old story says there are little men up here who play ninepins right down in that gorge in the, gorge in the twilight. She peered at me. Are you one of them? Oh, no, 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 I said. I read that story. It's just make-believe. I laughed and she puckered her forehead. Well, come on, she said. Make some use of yourself and help me fill this basket with strawberries. I hesitated. She meant my strawberry supply. Now get on with you. A boy your age should be doing something worthwhile instead of playing mumbly peg with sticks. Come on, young man. She jogged me out into the meadow. We worked quite a while before we said any more. Frankly, I was wondering how to save my precious, precious strawberries, and I may say I picked slowly. Every time I dropped one in her basket, I thought how good it would taste. Where do you live? I jumped. It is terribly odd to hear a voice after weeks of listening only to birds and raccoons. And what is more, to hear the voice ask a question like that. I live here, I said. You mean Delhi? Fine, you can walk me home. Nothing I added did any good. She would not be shaken from her belief that I lived in Delhi, so I let it go. We must have reaped every last strawberry before she stood up, put her arm in mine, and escorted me down the mountain. I certainly was not escorting her. Her wiry little arms were like crayfish pinchers. I couldn't have gotten away if I had tried. So I walked and listened. She told me all the local and world news, and it was rather pleasant to hear about the National League, an atom bomb test, and a Mr. Riley's three-legged dog that chased her chickens. In the middle of all this chatter, she said, That's the best strawberry patch in the entire Catskill range. I come up here every spring. For 40 years I've come to that meadow for my strawberries. It gets harder every year, but there's no jam can beat the jam from that mountain. I know. I've been around here all my life. Then she went right into the New York Yanks without putting in a period. As I helped her across the stream on big boulders, I heard a cry in the sky. I looked up. Swinging down the valley on long pointed wings was a large bird. I was struck by the ease and swiftness of its flight. Duck hawk, she said, nest around here every year. My man used to shoot them. He said they killed chickens, but I don't believe it. 
The only thing that kills chickens is Mr. Riley's three-legged dog. She tipped and teetered as she crossed the rocks, but kept right on talking and stepping as if she knew that no matter what, she would get across. We finally reached the road. I wasn't listening to her very much. I was thinking about the duck hawk. This bird, I was sure, was the peregrine falcon, the king's hunting bird. I will get one. I will train it to hunt for me, I said to myself. Finally, I got the little lady to her brown house at the edge of town. She turned fiercely upon me. I started back. Where are you going, young man? I stopped. Now I thought she's going to march me into town. Into town? Well, that's where I'll need to go then, I said to myself. And I turned on my heel, smiled at her, and replied, To the library. The King's Provider Miss Turner was glad to see me. I told her I wanted some books on hawks and falcons, and she located a few, although there was not much to be had on the subject. We worked all afternoon, and I learned enough. I departed when the library closed. Miss Turner whispered to me as I left, Sam, you need a haircut. I hadn't seen myself in so long that this had not occurred to me. Gee, I don't have any scissors. She thought a minute got out her library scissors, and sat me down on the back steps. She did a fine job, and I looked like any other boy who had played hard all day, and who, with a little soap and water after supper, would be going off to bed in a regular house. I didn't get back to my tree that night. The May apples were ripe, and I stuffed on those as I went through the woods. They taste like a very sweet banana, are earthy and a little slippery, but I liked them. At the stream I caught a trout— Everybody thinks a trout is hard to catch because of all the fancy gear and flies and lines sold for trout fishing, but honestly, they are easier to catch than any other fish. They have big mouths and snatch and swallow whole anything they see when they are hungry. With my wooden hook in its mouth, the trout was mine. The trouble is that trout are not hungry when most people have time to fish. I knew they were hungry that evening because the creek was swirling and minnows and everything else were jumping out of the water. When you see that, go fish. You'll get them. I made a fire on a flat boulder in the stream and cooked the trout. I did this so I could watch the sky. I wanted to see the falcon again. I also put the trout head on the hook and dropped it into the pool. A snapping turtle would view a trout head with relish. I waited for the falcon patiently. I didn't have to go anywhere. After an hour or so, I was rewarded. A slender speck came from the valley and glided above the stream. It was still far away when it folded its wings and bombed the earth. I watched. It arose, clumsy and big, carrying food, and winged back to the valley. I sprinted down the stream and made myself a lean-to near some cliffs where I thought the bird had disappeared. Having learned that day that duck hawks prefer to nest on cliffs, I settled for this site. Early the next morning, I got up and dug the tubers of the arrow leaf that grew along the stream bank. I baked these and boiled mussels for breakfast. Then I curled up behind a willow and watched the cliff. The falcons came in from behind me and circled the stream. They had apparently been out hunting before I had gotten up, as they were returning with food. This was exciting news. They were feeding young, and I was somewhere near the nest. I watched one of them swing into the cliff and disappear. A few minutes later, it winged out empty-footed. I marked the spot mentally and said, Ha! After splashing across the stream in the shallows, I stood at the bottom of the cliff and wondered how on earth I was going to climb the sheer wall. I wanted a falcon so badly, however, that I dug in with my toes and hands and started up. The first part was easy. It was not too steep. When I thought I was stuck, I found a little ledge and shinnied up to it. I was high, and when I looked down, the stream spun. I decided not to look down anymore. I edged up to another ledge and lay down on it to catch my breath. I was shaking from exertion, and I was tired. I looked up to see how much higher I had had to go when my hand touched something moist. I pulled it back and saw that it was white. Bird droppings. Then I saw them. Almost where my hand had been sat three fuzzy, whitish-gray birds. Their wide-open mouths gave them a startled look. Oh, hello, hello, I said. You are cute. 
When I spoke, all three blinked at once. All three heads turned and followed my hand as I swung it up and toward them. All three watched my hand with open mouths. They were marvelous. I chuckled, but I couldn't reach them. I wormed forward and wham! Something hit my shoulder. It pained. I turned to my head to see the big female. She had hit me. She winged out, banked, and started back for another strike. Now I was scared, for I was sure she would cut me wide open. With sudden nerve, I stood up, stepped forward, and picked up the biggest of the nestlings. The females are bigger than the males. They are the falcons. They are the pride of kings. I tucked her in my sweater and leaned against the cliff, facing the bullet-like dive of the falcon. I threw out my foot as she struck, and the sole of my tennis shoe took the blow. The female was now gathering speed for another attack, and when I say speed, I mean 50 to 60 miles an hour. I could see myself battered and torn, lying in the valley below, and I said to myself, Sam Gribbly, you had better get down from here like a rabbit. I jumped to the ledge below, found it was really quite wide, slid onto the seat of my pants to the next ledge, and stopped. The hawk apparently couldn't count. She did not know I had a youngster, for she checked her nest, saw the open mouths, and then she forgot me. I scrambled to the riverbed somehow, being very careful not to hurt the hot, fuzzy body that was against my own. However, frightful, as I had called her right then and there because of the difficulties we had had in getting together, did not think so gently of me. She dug her talons into my skin to brace herself during the bumpy ride to the ground. I stumbled to the stream, placed her in a nest of buttercups, and dropped beside her. I fell asleep. When I awoke, my eyes opened on two gray eyes in a white, strubly head. Small pin feathers were sticking up out of the strubly down, like feathers in a quiver. The big blue beak curled down in a snarl and up in a smile. Oh, frightful, I said. You are a raving beauty. Frightful fluffed her nubby feathers and shook. I picked her up in the cup of my hands and held her under my chin. I stuck my nose in the deep warm fuzz. It smelled dusty and sweet. I liked that bird. Oh, how I liked that bird from that smelly minute. It was so pleasant to feel the beating life and see the funny little awkward movements of a young thing. The legs pushed out between my fingers. I gathered them up together with the thrashing wings and tucked the bird in one piece under my chin. I rocked. Frightful, I said. You will enjoy what we are going to do. I washed my bit, bleeding shoulder in the creek, tucked the thorn threads of, torn threads of my sweater back into the hole they had come out of, and set out for my tree. A brief account of what I did about the first man who was after me. At the edge of the meadow, I sensed all was not well at camp. How I knew there was a human being there was not clear to me then. I can only say that after living so long with the birds and animals, the movement of a human is like the difference between the explosion of a cat pistol and a cannon. I wormed toward camp. When I could see the man I felt to be there, I stopped and looked. He was wearing a forester's uniform. Immediately I had thought they had sent someone out to bring me in, and I began to shake. Then I realized that I didn't have to go back to meet the man at all. I was perfectly free and capable of settling down anywhere. My tree was just a pleasant habit. I circled the meadow and went over to the gorge. On the way, I checked a trap. It was a deadfall, a figure four under a big rock. The rock was down. The food was rabbit. I picked a comfortable place just below the rim of the gorge, where I could pop up every now and then and watch my tree. Here I dressed down the rabbit and fed frightful some of the more savory bites from a young falcon's point of view, the liver, the heart, the brain. She ate in gulps. As I watched her swallow, I sensed a great pleasure. It is hard to explain my feelings at that moment. It seemed marvelous to see life pump through that strange little body of feathers, wordless noises, milk eyes, much as life pumped through me. The food put the bird to sleep. I watched her eyelids close from the bottom up and her head quiver. The fuzzy body rocked. The tail spread to steady it. 
and the little duck hawk almost sighed as she sank into the leaves, sleeping. I had lots of time. I was going to wait for the man to leave. So I stared at my bird, the beautiful details of the new feathers, the fern-like lashes along the lids, the saucy bristles at the base of the beak. Pleasant hours passed. Frightful would awaken. I would feed her. She would fall back to sleep, and I would watch the breath rock her body ever so slightly. I was breathing the same way, only not as fast. Her heart beat much faster than mine. She was designed to her bones for a swifter life. It finally occurred to me that I was very hungry. I stood up to see if the man were gone. He was yawning and pacing. The sun was slanting on him now, and I could see him quite well. He was a fire warden. Of course, it has not rained, I told myself, for almost three weeks, and the fire planes have been circling the mountains and valleys, patrolling the mountains. Apparently, the smoke from my fire was spotted, and a man was sent to check it. I recalled the bare trampled ground around the tree, the fireplace of rocks filled with ashes, the wood chips from the making of my bed, and resolved hereafter to keep my yard clean. So I made rabbit soup in a tin can I found at the bottom of the gorge. I seasoned it with wild garlic and jack-in-the-pulpit roots. Jack-in-the-pulpits have three big leaves on a stalk and are easily recognized by the curly striped awning above a stiff, serious preacher named Jack. The jack-in-the-pulpit root, or corm, tastes and looks like a potato. It should never be eaten raw. The fire I made was only the driest of wood, and I made it right at the water's edge. I didn't want a smoky fire on this particular evening. After supper, I made a bow bed and stretched out with Frightful beside me. Apparently, the more you stroke and handle a falcon, the easier they are to train. I had all sorts of plans for hoods and jessies, as the straps on a falcon are called, and I soon forgot about the man. Stretched on the boughs, I listened to the wood peewees calling their haunting good nights until I fell sound asleep. Until next time, Miss Carrie, Miss Carrie, Miss Carrie.